Thank you, Rabbi Silverman. I was going to say, you might not want to sit under there. That's, that's the splash zone down there. So, um, uh, Ra Rabbi, Rabbi Silverman uh, has done something in our hearing, in our witness today, that is a great tradition of Judaism. She has taken a piece of scripture and molded it into a new understanding. That's called Midrash. That, you gave us a new teaching. Um, and so we say at the end of a reading, the word of God for the people of God, and you gave us the word of God for the people of God. So let us all say together, thanks be to God. Thank you so much. And could you please stand my colleague and friend who's been referred to several times, Rabbi Sharon Mars from Temple Israel, the senior rabbi of Temple Israel. Thank you for being with us today. Sharon, uh, years ago, uh, not, not that many, maybe three or four, before the pandemic, uh, I was sitting right where you are with um, members of the youth group at uh, Tefereth Israel, and I said to the kids, our teens were leading worship that day, and I said to the kids, if you have any questions about anything that goes on in the service, just ask me, right? So the young girl sitting beside me, after singing the first couple of hymns, said, I understand who Jesus is, but who's this guy Christ? And I said, well, that's kind of Jesus' last name in Christianity, so. And, but, uh, you know, so if you hear that a lot today, that's, you know where it comes from, so. It is good to be together today, and uh, again, as we continue in this series, I wanna say that after services today, Rabbi Silverman will greet you at the Broad Street door with me, but then we're gonna go to the art museum and sit around the table and have some food before she catches her plane back to Israel with Esther, not too far into the afternoon. So uh, we'll, we'll be together and we invite you to join us to break bread as well. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of each one of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our salvation. Amen. Abraham Maslow was born in Brooklyn, New York in 1908, the oldest of seven children. His parents were uneducated Jews who had immigrated to save their lives from Ukraine. Abraham described himself as a slow and tidy child. He remembered his childhood as lonely and rather unhappy because, as he said, I was a little Jewish boy in a completely non-Jewish neighborhood. It was a little like being the first black child enrolled in an all-white school in the South. I was isolated and unhappy. I grew up in libraries and among books. He pursued the law, but went to graduate school at the University of Wisconsin to study psychology. He returned to New York with his doctorate, and there he spent most of his lifetime developing a new discipline called humanistic psychology. Maslow was revolutionizing the study of human behavior and the mind with one simple belief. He believed that every person has a strong desire to reach and realize his or her full human potential. He called it self-actualization to prove that humans are not simply blindly reacting to situations, but trying to accomplish something greater, he studied mentally healthy individuals instead of people with serious psychological issues. As he once said, Dr. Freud has supplied us with the sick half of psychology. Now we must fill it in with a healthy half. Way to go, Abraham. Studying healthy people informed his theory that people experience peak experiences in life, high points in life, when the individual is in harmony with himself or herself and surroundings, a self-actualized person. In Maslow's view, self-actualized people can have many peak experiences throughout a day, while others have those experiences less frequently. Self-actualized persons are reality-centered, and have a great ability to differentiate between what is fraudulent and what is genuine. They are what he called problem-centered, meaning that they can treat life's challenges as problems that demand solutions. He named Jesus of Nazareth 
Albert Einstein and Lao Tzu as the, the father of Taoism as three such people in his studies. To demonstrate the ascendancy of his theory, he developed a visual aid that many of us know called the hierarchy of needs. It is a pyramid depicting the levels of human needs, psychological and physical. When a human being ascends the steps of the pyramid, that person reaches self-actualization. At the bottom of the pyramid are basic needs, of physiological needs, of human beings. They're food, water, sex. The next level is safety needs, security, order, and stability. These two steps, though very important to physical survival, are not where it ends for the person. Once individuals have basic nutrition, shelter, and safety, they attempt to accomplish more. The third level is a need called love and belonging, which are psychological needs. And then when individuals have taken care of themselves physically and they're ready to share themselves with others, they move to the fourth level, which is achieved when they feel comfortable with what they've accomplished. This is called the esteem level, the level of success and status for self and for others. And finally, at the top of the pyramid is the need for self-actualization. That occurs when individuals reach a state of harmony and understanding. Clearly, without meeting basic needs and safety needs, one cannot ascend to love and belonging to esteem and ultimately to self-actualizing needs. Now you're wondering, what does this have to do with the Lord's Prayer? That's a really good question. Here we go. His theories meet the Lord's Prayer, just as it is, with the words, give us this day our daily bread, a self-actualized, oldest of seven, first century Jewish peasant from Nazareth named Jesus, encounters a self-actualized, oldest of seven, 20th century Jewish Ukrainian immigrant named Abraham. Without daily bread, without meeting basic needs, no one can reach peak experiences to which Jesus calls us in our encounter with God and with one another. Jesus knows this as he teaches the disciples to pray to our Father in heaven. Today, the challenge to recite this petition is ever growing in a world which hungers for bread, hungers for bread in ways that should not be in the 21st century. In America alone, we are seeing an ever increasing cry for daily bread. In 2022, there are over 37.2 million Americans who live below the poverty level. It's 11.4% of our population. Now, poverty levels are calculated as two adults and two children living with $27,479 of annual income or less. As many as 13 million children will wake up this morning and go to bed tonight in homes that are food insecure. That means that in that family of four, someone in that house will not eat anything today. Considering that we are the breadbasket for the world, how is it looking for the billions of others who occupy this planet we call home? It's bleak, to say the least. Indian theologian Musa Somana speaking from one of the world's hungriest countries, writes to his fellow Christians, to pray for daily bread is a simple but clear reminder to all. It is God's will that there will be food for all, but that food is not readily available to all on a daily basis. Praying for daily bread confronts those with refrigerators and storerooms and supermarkets stuffed with food with this question, why do I not feel the urgency to pray for daily bread while some homeless, some jobless, and even some hardworking persons have nothing to put on their plates and to feed their children today? The Lord's Prayer, he finishes, challenges all who eat, all who store, or all who throw away food to be producers and givers of daily bread to a hungry world. 
let's break this down a little bit more clearly. Someone in our house of worship this day will be challenged to find daily bread in the next 24 hours. We have members and friends of our congregation who can say this and they don't know the source where their daily bread will come from. Recently, I spoke to one of our members, one of our family of faith, who told me a few days ago, I was down to my last half cup of rice. I was paid that day and I was able to go to the grocery to go shopping. Give us this day our daily bread is not a given, even at First Church. So what was Jesus saying when he offered this prayer? The Aramaic word for bread is lachma, which has multiple meanings. It means both food and it means understanding. In his book, Prayers of the Cosmos, Neil Douglas Klotz writes, the root of this word comes from the divine feminine, Hama, which pictures growing vigor, warmth, passion, possibility, and all the instruments of generative power. In Proverbs, we see this as holy wisdom. So bread is food and understanding. To use Maslow's hierarchy of needs, bread is, in this context, fills the physiological and the spiritual self-actualizing needs. In addition, the word for daily in Aramaic breaks down to this, that which belongs to someone, that which is essential. So daily translates that which is essential that belongs to someone and gives them daily bread, right? For Jesus, daily bread would have been f food of essence plus food of understanding and the belonging that it comes with it. For all of us to provide daily bread is more than putting food on the table, so to speak. It hearkens more to Maslow's understanding of self-actualization. For us, daily bread feeds our bodies, our minds, and our souls. It is sustenance that provides so much more than food. It's about community and family. It's about solidarity and unity. It's about our connection to one another and at the center of our lives to God. It is about what Rabbi Silverman blessed us with this day and continues to bless us with in Second Nurture. It's about bringing everyone together to make a difference for one and more than one. Give us this day our daily bread is the turning point of the Lord's Prayer. The first part of the prayer was directed toward heaven, toward the divine reality of God, the intimate relationship with our spiritual parent, and the ultimate coming of God's kingdom and God's will being done. Now, in the second part of the prayer, Jesus gets real. He brings the focus from heaven to earth. Bread is necessary for life and for understanding one another. It provides us with the strength to forgive the disruptions and divisions in the human community and our fellowship, which will strengthen us against temptation and ultimately in the weeks to come deliver us from evil. In this turning point of the Lord's Prayer, there is no mystery, there's no spiritualizing. We see human life in concrete biological, social, and historical contexts that Jesus dealt with. He was like that. He faced reality and he dealt with it. When he was teaching by the Sea of Galilee and the time came for people to eat, he consulted his disciples. Seeing that the people around him were hungry, he asked the disciples what we should do. And the disciples said, and you're gonna love it, send them away. No! Oh! Wrong answer! Right, Jesus is like, what have I spent all my time teaching you for if this is the answer you come up with? No, send them away is not the right answer. The correct answer is, feed them, right? Even today, Jesus' disciples will hear a knock at the door and the hungry outside, and they'll say, aha, send them away, listening to the disciples rather than to Jesus. A friend said to me this week, our greatest challenge in Ohio right now today is creeping poverty and hunger everywhere. That's knocking on our doors all the time. Jesus would have none of that if he were here. He works for miracles. He doesn't work miracles, he works for them. I want you to think about this. He feeds those around him. The miracle of feeding the 5,000 hungry students on the hillside at the north shore of Lake Tiberias, which Christians like to call the Sea of Galilee, 
was a distributive justice issue, right? Jesus called upon his followers to share what they had. So that's what they did. They listened to him instead of the disciples. They shared what they had, and that was the miracle. They all gathered around the resources they had, stuck in their robes and stuck by their sandals and everything like that. They brought it together and they fed each other. And what happened at the end? They had baskets full of food left over. See, Jesus never works from a mentality of scarcity, always from abundance. For Jesus, it was never about the food in the first place, but it's always about just food. So how do we share what we have? When do we share what we have? With whom do we share what we have? Why do we share what we have? These are the questions which drive Jesus. These are the questions which should drive each one of us, that should open and close each day and each encounter with prayer. Life lived out in prayer is always life lived out in daily bread with justice. When Jesus took bread, blessed bread, broke bread, gave bread, this action was more than the fourfold action of the Lord's Supper. It was more than a Last Supper memorial feast for his disciples. It was more than distribution of food by the seaside. It was distributive justice. It was the Eucharist as God's coming to earth. Each time we're at the communion table, taking, blessing, breaking, giving, we are living out the action of life itself. When we take our lives each day, thanking and blessing God for what God has given us, and we break the bread and we break ourselves in giving to others, we are crossing the threshold of earth and heaven. In the words of Celtic spirituality, when we do this, we have traversed the thin space between here and now and eternity. Jesus knew this. He still knows it. Let us work together with one another in the name of Jesus to give daily bread and know that our God is all about leading us to take, to bless, to break, to give as God's way of making us complete, filling us up, and seeing that we become self-actualized, that we become beautiful human beings, like Jesus, like Abraham.